All right, so OBS is recording. And we'll start with the three questions on the board right now. And I am going to document this, you know, just so that, you know, we don't end up watching a video with, with some assumptions, you know, this is on the, um, in the uh, visual part of it. So I got it already typed in earlier, except, you know, my computer was a little bit locked up earlier, but I got it back. Everything is back to normal. Okay, so give me just one more second to get this into your view. There we go. All right, so this is Joplin, which I have explained a little bit from last time. So let me get rid of the two windows that are not needed. Uh, we are focusing on these three questions, okay? So we'll start with this one. All right, so first of all, what do you think is the answer of this one, which is also you know, uh, on the projector, you know, which is this one here? What is it? What is the answer? Go ahead. It is false. Very good. Okay, that is correct. This is false. Okay, so you got the right answer. Do we have any, does anyone want to talk about this? Go ahead. In other words, using the folder analogy, I'm asking, is there a empty folder inside an empty folder? Well, since if we call it an empty folder, nothing can be in it, including an empty folder. Does that, is that working okay? All right, yep, go ahead. Uh, a set cannot be within itself. That is correct. But in this case, you know, I guess you know, I know and I understand what you're talking about because in general, since a set cannot be in itself, then the empty set is a special case of a set and therefore it cannot be in itself either. Okay, you, that's a good argument as well. All right, what about the second one, this one? What is the answer to the second one, which is, the empty set is in a set where there's an empty set as a member. True, okay, that is correct. Does anyone want me to talk about this? Nope, all right. What about the last one? It is false, okay? Because what we have in the set, okay, is a set, this is a set of a set that has an empty set in it. So that's why you know, the empty set is not in the set that is on the right-hand side of the membership operator. So this one is actually false. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause here and see if there are any questions that you guys want me to address because I think the first two, most people go like, yep, I got it. What about the last one? Are we getting the last one? Okay, yep, go ahead. That is correct, okay? So based on what you're saying, you're basically saying, what if we do this, right? So in that case, the answer would be true, all right? Very good. So let's go back to the first one, okay? The first, I think once you can answer all of these, you can probably answer the first one, which is this one. So what is the answer to the first one? What is the, the value of the expression? False. It is false, very good. Does, do we want any discussion on this one? No questions, all right. All right, so now we can get back to the ones in the announcement, okay? I hope most of you at least have a moment to take a look at those in the announcement. And let's see, all right, there we go. Switch to announcement, <clears throat> quick check. All right, so there we go. So I'm just gonna point to these ones and then just tell you what the answer is. Okay, what about the first one? 
the value of, in parentheses, E is in N, as in the set of all natural numbers, implies E is in Z, which is the set of all integers. What is the value of this particular expression? Sorry? It is true. Okay, very good. But I didn't even tell you what E is. What if E is pi, which is not even a rational number, it's an irrational number. So what happens when E is pi? What happens to that expression? Yes. And what would that do to the implication? That is correct. But what happens to the value of the implication? It is true. Very good. OK. So that is the key to answer this question, is for anything that is not a natural number, such as pi, such as tac, and so on and so forth, the left-hand side of the implication is false. When the left-hand side of the implication is false, the implication itself is true. So that means regardless of what E is, the implication is always true. In other words, no one can tell me it's like, well, tech, it depends on what E is. Okay, If E is actually a natural number, I can see how the implication is true. But when E is some other values, I can see how this implication can be false. The answer is no. The implication is always true regardless of what E is. Is that part OK? Oh, that would change it tremendously, yes. <laughs> that would change it tremendously. If it is an and, okay, then we can, we can make it false. The entire thing can be false, it can be true, it depends on what E we are putting into that variable, what value we put into the variable E. But in this case, because it's an implication, then the expression is always true. Is that okay? This is, what do you think I'm testing you? What am, okay, not testing, checking. What do you think I'm checking in this case? There are at least two, three things that I'm testing, that I'm checking. What two or three things do you think I'm checking on? Uh-huh, okay, so member of, and which part is the member of, you know, operator? Describe it. It looks like an E, but it's not an E, like this one here. Okay, so that's notation. Okay, notation is important. What other things do you think I'm checking on with just this one single question itself? Implication. Okay, implication is an operator. What does it mean? Okay, if the left hand side is true, then what do you think the left hand, the right hand side has to be in order for the implication to be true? It's a truth table, okay? Just look up the truth table and go like, okay, this is the implication operator. It is defined by a truth table, all right? And then the last one, you know, because I said three items, the last one is you know, what is this symbol here? Because I explained in the question itself what n or the funny looking n is, it's the set of all natural numbers. I didn't quite explain what this one was. That's because it is explained in the notes. We actually talked about it last Wednesday. In other words, I am checking to see whether people studied a little bit and reviewed the material over the past five days. Now, is it going to be crucial in the first week to do this? I would say not too much. Okay, you can still catch up. But, you know, um, if it is a trend that people do not study and review the material and just kind of let things pile up, um, that may not be a good strategy for this class. I cannot say this for other classes because, you know, how other people teach their classes is none of my business. But for this class, concepts do pile up. So you definitely want to make sure that you spend the time to review the concepts. Otherwise, you know, comes exam one, and things will be piled up so high that some people will go like, I have no idea what the question is asking. That happens almost every semester, unfortunately. 
All right, let's work on the second one, okay? So for the second one, I have a definition to start with. In other words, don't ask me why W is defined this way. It just is, okay? So W is defined to be a set because of the braces uh, where each element X has to meet the requirement of X is in Z and in parentheses, X is less than zero or X mod three equals to one, okay? That's how W is defined. And then the three subparts, the four subparts, excuse me, the four subparts are really checking, um, is that thing a member of W as it is defined? Okay, so we'll move on to these one by one. Is negative four a member of W? The answer is yes, because uh, X being less than zero qualifies that integer to be in um, W. But it still needs to be an integer first. In other words, negative 4.2 would not be a member because the conjunction is on the outside of the disjunction. So that means it has to be an integer. Then we have some additional requirements that also has to be met. What about one? Is one a member of W? It is because that is correct. One mod three is one. Very good. What about three? Three is not a member because three is not negative and three mod three is a zero, which is not one. What about five? Mm, it's not a member either because five is not negative and then five mod three is two, which means this equality would be false. So that means we have false or false, which means the entire side here is false. So even though five is an integer, but since this is a conjunction, we need both sides to be true for the entire conjunction to be true. So this particular question is checking on whether you remember the notation of a set. How do we describe membership of a set that has an infinite number of elements? Using that, you know, x such that notation, this is the notation. I'm testing whether you remember what this operator is and also what this operator is. Because you know, for people who are new to this class and has not taken a math class before, these are new notations, which means unless you put some effort into reviewing the material, you know, typically people would look at this and go like, I don't remember, okay? Unless you review. So I'm hoping the entire class goes like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember because I reviewed the material. Okay, so now we have three more questions to go, okay? So of these three questions, V and W as sets are defined exactly the same way. So the only question is, what are the members of X? What are the members of Y? And what are the members of Z? All right, so let's go for the first one, okay? The first one says, um, X is a set where each member E has to meet the requirement of E is in V and E is in W. So what are the exact members of X? One and two, very good. No, not one and two, one and three. So that is correct because one three is in V, one three is also in W. So X is basically, you know, has those two elements. Any questions about this one? Okay, what about the second one? If you look at the second one, it looks almost exactly the same as the first one except I use you know, Y as the variable of the set, but what are the members of Y in this case? Go ahead. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven. One, two, yep, so it's one, two, three, four, five, seven, because this is an or. So each member of Y has to be found in either I shouldn't say either, should be found in at least one of the two sets, B or W. Can it be in both? Yes, one and three are in both. We don't have a problem with that. But we only count it once. In other words, the membership of Y is not one, one, two, three, three, five, seven, okay? Because one and three can only appear up to once in a set. All right, the last one is a little bit interesting. It looks almost exactly the, the same as the first one, except we got a negation here. So what are the membership of 
uh, z in this case. It has to be in v, but it cannot be in w. Go ahead. Five and seven, very good, okay? So for the last one, it is only five and seven because there's a conjunction here, which means everything in z also has to be in v. However, there's a second requirement, which is it cannot be a member of w. You can see how one is a member of w, three is also a member of w. Those cannot be in the set z because of the way it is defined. All right, so this is a quick check, okay? I'm checking on a few things, mostly just notations. Um, do you know how to read this kind of notation, which is kind of the same as this kind of notation, describing the qualifications of members in a set? I'm checking to see whether you remember the conjunction, disjunction, negation, and implication symbols, as well as you know, how they are defined, um, and also you know, how Z is the set of all integers, and the membership um, you know, symbol as well. So this is, as I said, a quick check that took about 20 minutes. Are there any questions, any you know, um, topic you want me to go over? Yep. Um, yes, so there is an operator precedence. Um, conjunction has the, negation has the highest priority has the highest your precedence and then followed by conjunction and then followed by disjunction which is also the same as in C++. Uh, implication is not defined in C++. It has the least uh, priority. Typically I try to use parentheses you know, whenever I remember but sometimes I forget so you know if you want to make sure that you get the right precedence you know you can just ask me. Okay all right. Any other questions? Nope, okay. So if there are no other questions, let me see. All right, so we are, yep, go ahead. Each and every? Yeah. Oh, okay, the if and only if? The, the equal sign and then the vertical bar. The equal sign and the vertical bar, not equal to? No. no, no the, Oh, okay. Um, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, we are just going to use the C++, you know, priority precedence. So if you look up, you know, the C++ operator priority, the only two that we do not have in this priority list is would be implication and if and only if or equivalence. So those two would be lowest, uh, lower than all of the other ones. All right. So this is a good page, you know, even though you know, this is CISP 440, um, this is still a useful page because you know, if you see someone you know, expressing things without using parentheses, you should know, you know how those, those you know, operators or expressions are grouped. So this is a, always a good resource to refer to, even for your other classes. All right, cool. So now we're gonna go to set operators. Um, so here we go, you, know, you look at this and go like, didn't we talk about this? The answer is yes, we actually talked about this, except I didn't give it a name, now we give it a name. So the first operator <laughs> we defined is called the intersection operator. Given that A and B are sets, the intersection of A and B is expressed using this little symbol here. And once again, if you're curious of how to you know, type this in, it is called a cap, okay? In LaTeX, this is called a cap. Um, and the definition of A cap B or A intersect B is exactly what we saw earlier, okay? The intersection of A and B would be the elements or a set with elements that can be found in both A and B, okay? Is that a part okay? So you can see how you know the uh, concept check is not really just checking the concepts, it's also connecting to the concepts that we are introducing today, okay? And it can also, you know, because you know, we talked about 
the description of a set with an infinite number or unknown number of members. It is the same thing as what is following here. And I just use extra parentheses, so operator priority is not an issue in this case. Are we doing okay so far? Do we see how these two are really defining the same thing? The symbol A cap B is a set that is described like this. And then on the other one here, I'm describing E is a member of A cap B if and only if E is in A and E is in B. So they're basically saying the same thing. For clarity, my personal preference is the second one because there's no way to misinterpret the second one. The first one is kind of like, Ugh, maybe, okay? The second one, no chance of your misinterpretation. But most mathematicians you know, prefer the first one. That's just a much more well-accepted you know, uh, symbol. All right, moving on. So the next operator is union, okay? This is also called a cup. So if one is called a cap, this is a cup. So A cup B, or A union B, is a set. It has the elements that can be found in um, at least one of A or B. Can it be found in both? Yes, not a problem, but at least one of those two, okay? So once again, okay, you know, this is the usual notation used by mathematicians. Um, and we went through one of these examples already as the concept check. Are we still doing okay so far? Are there any questions? Nope, okay, all right. So moving on to the next one. This one is called a difference. So A different, A minus B, if you want to say it as A minus B, that's fine. Um, then we are looking at a set where the members are found in A, but not in B. We also went through that example earlier in the concept check. Are we okay so far? Are we making those connections? Because you know, I'm just formally introducing the symbol of, of what this means you know, in this case, but we have already talked about the concept much earlier in when I went over the announcements. Okay, all right. So we are moving on to the next one, which is a kind of funny one, okay? This one, you would understand it better if you have taken linear algebra, but even if you have not taken linear algebra, we can describe it fairly easily. This is called the Cartesian product, okay? So it looks like a multiplication, but it's called the Cartesian uh, product. So the Cartesian product of two sets, A, B, is by itself a set. But this time, what each member looks like in the Cartesian product is what we call a two-tuple. So the parentheses you know, surrounding x, y, in, you know, separated by a comma, that pair of parentheses is not optional because it is a part of the notation. Question? Okay, that's okay. So x, y is a two-tuple. I'll explain that you know, just a little bit in just a little bit. A two-tuple is basically an array. Okay, where position is important. The first one, X, has to be from A. The second, y, the second one, Y, has to be from B. Okay, so an example would be very helpful in this case. So we'll go ahead and talk about an example. And I'm going to use Joplin. Okay, Joplin is just a great tool for this sort of thing. So we'll go ahead and say, you know, new... Concepts. You can focus on the right-hand side you know, and not focus on what I'm typing on the left-hand side unless you want to learn the LaTeX way of typing you know, these notations. All right, so we are just going to take a look at the set AB, okay, AB as a set. And we are going to do a Cartesian product with the set of 1, 2. And we want to find out you know, what is the outcome of this thing here. What do you think is the outcome based on how it was described earlier? First of all, how many members are in, the, in, in this particular Cartesian product? Okay, it's not two. Four, okay, four is correct. 
But four is easy as a guess. So I'm going to make this a little bit harder here. Ding. <laughs> now, how many members are in the Cartesian product? It's six. Very good. So it's the product of the number of members from each one. Okay. Because what's going to happen is we pair up each member of the left hand side with each member on the left hand side. Okay, so if I were to spell out the exact membership in this case, then we have A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, and B3. The ordering of the two tuples is important. In other words, 1A as a two tuple would not be in this Cartesian product. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? Okay, because Cartesian product is a very important concept in this class. We'll use this concept to talk about functions. We'll talk about relations. We'll talk about algorithms that we are going to deal with later on or actually toward the end of the semester. Are we doing okay so far? In some interesting way, it is basically saying, okay, we got one set on the left-hand side. We got one set on the right-hand side. Give me all the possible ways of pairing up one element from the left-hand side set with one element from the right-hand side set. It's kind of like asking that question. Okay. All right, so my watch is buzzing me, which means it's a good time to take a break, and then we're going to take roll. So go ahead and sign in to Canvas. And I'm going to unhide the road taking activity for today. And I cannot even remember what passcode I was using. We'll find out. All right, so oh, let me publish first. So now if you refresh your browser, you should be able to see it. And the access code is nay, N-A-Y. I don't even remember why I chose and nay. While you're doing this, I'm going to check and make sure that my recorder is still on. Okay, it's still on. Good. I saw eight people reviewing or watching the video from last week. That's a good sign. Okay, you know, people are using it as a resource. All right. Does anyone need more time for the road taking activity? Nope. Okay. All right. So we are good to go. Moving on. All right. So now we want to look at something like this. Okay. Um, we can define some set operators that return true or false. So everything that we have talked about so far, they return an entire set. Um, the intersection returns an entire set. The union returns an entire set. And then the uh, difference returns an entire set. Cartesian product returns an entire set. But you know what? Before we move on, I want to ask you some trick questions. So let's go ahead and do some trick questions. Okay. And we'll take a look at, oh, okay, just messed up the other one that I had. There we go. All right, so we are going to take a look at, you know, A, B. And we'll have a Cartesian product with the empty set. And I want to know what the answer is. What do you think? So we have a set with two elements, A, B. And we are using the Cartesian product operator to Cartesian product it with an empty set. So what do you think the answer is going to be? Hmm? An empty set. That is correct. It is the empty set itself. Why do you think that is the case? Okay, so it kind of really goes back to the definition. So when you look at the definition uh, of the two tuple, if, if there is a member as a two tuple, the second member of the two tuple has to be found in B or the right hand side of the Cartesian product operator. So if B is an empty set, can you find an element in an empty set? No. So that means you know, we cannot possibly have a two-tuple 
where the second item of the two tuple is coming from you know um, the right hand side of the of the operator all right so this is a little bit tricky not hopefully not too much you know but conceptually it is important to understand yep why is nothing considered Oh, I see what you mean. Because, because you cannot have nothing here. Y is still a Y is a placeholder, and we need Y to be in a particular set. So if you have one comma but nothing in the second one, you don't have a two tuple anymore. You have a one tuple. But the whatever the each member of the Cartesian product has to be a two tuple. It has to have two elements in it. Sort of, okay. <clears throat> we are going to talk about permutations, and permutations is interesting. Um, we'll get to it, okay? Yeah, because one of the questions you know that people would ask is, you have a bag of say ten marbles, okay? And I give you an empty bag, and I say, choose nothing out of this bag of ten marbles. How many ways can you do it? No, no. one way. <laughs> so, so that is the trickiness of you know, using the term permutation because you know, when you're counting the number of ways of choosing, there's one way to choose nothing out of however many that you start off with. To, exactly, yep. So that's why you know, we, we, we kind of want to be careful when we talk about that yep. it's because it's not the same thing. There's one way to get nothing, yeah. which is weird because nothing is nothing there should be zero way but nope there's one way all right so are we still doing okay so far okay all right so moving on so now we're going to define the subset of operator and you can see how i'm using all of the other operators to define you know the subset of in other words now, this one is actually redundant, okay? In other words, this is more complicated than it has to be. But is it wrong, okay? The answer is no, it's actually not wrong. It just doesn't have to be as complicated as it is. So the question is, um, so how can it be simpler, okay? But before we go that route, okay, we want to see how um, A is a subset of B is defined. So you can see this is a subset of B, and then later on we have something that looks very similar, but it's not the same, because this one is a proper subset of. So forget about the proper subset of, we'll focus on just subset of first. A is a subset of B, if and only if, A minus B, which is all the elements in A but not in B, is an empty set. Wait, hold on a second here. Isn't that really just a fancy way of saying everything in A is also in B? Yep, and that by itself is already sufficient to define A is a subset of B. The conjunction, the second part of the conjunction is not even needed. But either one can actually be used to define what is a subset of. In other words, these two, the two, the, the two sides of the conjun conjunction are actually equivalent. A minus B being an empty set, which means everything in A is also in B, is really saying the same thing as A insert intersecting with B is just A itself. That is correct, because they are equivalent. Or you can just choose one and not the other, because they are exactly the same thing. All right. So do we have any questions about the subset, sub, the subset of concept? 
Well, I'm going to test you guys on this, okay? So we'll go ahead and go to Joplin again, okay? You can see how I really like to use Joplin for this kind of thing. So we'll go ahead and take a look at A, B, and now we have to look at subset field of, okay? So in, um, in uh, LaTeX, it's subset EQ, you know, because it has an extra bar under it. So the EQ is important in this case. So I'm just gonna test this one first, okay? What about this? What kind of answer should I get? Yes, right off the bat, I gave you a somewhat slightly tricky case. I would say slightly. Okay, so go back to the definition, okay? Go back to the definition. What is the set of AB minus the set of AB? What does it mean? Okay, what does minus mean? A minus B means everything that is in A, but not in B, right? So in this case, what is in the set of AB, but not in the set of AB? Nothing. Empty, empty set, okay? In other words, this is gonna give us uh, AB minus AB as sets, it's gonna give us an empty set. Based on the definition of subset of, what do you think is the, out, is the value of that expression? The expression on this side, what is the value of this expression? True, okay, very good, okay? There we go, it is true indeed. Okay, let's try uh, another tricky case, okay? And this time we'll have, ooh, I like this one. What about this? The empty set. So is the empty set a subset of itself? Hmm? Okay, so plug it back in to the minus, right? A minus B is what in this case? What is in the empty set, but not in the empty set? Nothing, right? So the minus gives us an empty set. So based on the definition that we saw earlier, if the difference is an empty set, then whatever is on the left-hand side is a subset of whatever is on the right-hand side. So in this case, the answer is, True, it is also true. It's like, ugh, that doesn't feel good, okay? Because the empty set is a subset of itself, okay? So what about this one? Given any set A, A subset EQ A is, <laughs> so this time I don't even care about the membership of A. For all we know, it, A can be the set of all integers, all natural numbers, all the even numbers, blah, 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 okay? What do you think? So you go back to the definition, true. Okay, very good. It is true because regardless of what A really is, A minus A is guaranteed an empty set because we're asking that stupid question of what is in this set but not in the same set. It's like, that's a stupid question to ask. There'll be nothing. That's why every set is a subset of itself. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So after all the tricky case, I'll give you an easy one. You go like, isn't that supposed to be the other way around? No, it can be in any order I want. Uh, okay. So this time we're gonna give you some something that looks a little bit easier, okay? This is what people usually think when they think of subset. So what about the answer to this one? Okay, I just said this is the obvious one. <laughs> this one, you can use the intersection thing, right? You know, what is the intersection between a set that has A as a member and a set that has AB as members? The intersection is the set that only has A in it, right? Which is on the left-hand side of the subset of the little symbol. 
So this is true. Okay, so this is actually the easy one. Ooh, I got to give you this one. This is going to confuse some people, hopefully not the entire class. But if confusion has to happen, today is a good day because we are not in an exam today. Oh, I like that one. Okay, what about this one? It is true because the, the empty set is a subset of every set, okay? This is actually true. Yep. Yes. Yes. In other words, this is what I'm saying. Given any set, so A has to be a set in order for this to be defined, right? This is going to be true. The subset is an M is a subset of A. The empty set is a subset of A. This is also true. So, but this one is really kind of easy to see in a way because when we look at the intersection between the empty set and whatever set A, what do you think is the intersection between the empty set and whatever A is? It has to be the empty set, right? Because you know, the intersection contains elements that can be found in both. Well, since the empty set has nothing, that means the intersection also has to be empty in this case. But that meets the other requirement that I talked about earlier, you know, of what qualifies as a subset, is the intersection has to be whatever is on the left-hand side of the subset equal to, you know, operator. So this meets that requirement regardless of what A looks like. So the empty set is a subset of every set, including itself. Are we doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> So now we're going to move on to the notes here, and we'll take a look at subset equal to, oh, excuse me, okay, take it back. <laughs> We're going to take a look at proper subset. So without the bar, it is proper subset of. So we say that A is a proper subset of B if and only if, first of all, A has to be a subset of B, and we also want B minus A to be non-empty, okay? What does that mean? What is, what is the English description of just this part here? Whatever is on the right-hand side of the conjunction. Let me use the mouse pointer to point this part here. The difference of those two uh, sets should have a, um, a set with something in it. With something in it, which means there has to be at least one thing that is found in B but not found in A, okay? So what we'll do, Tack is going to do his <clears throat> lazy thing. Um, Joplin is great because it also recognizes um, the entire, uh, well, I shouldn't say entire, but it, it, you can also use um, VI you know, key binding in this one. Um, so I think it's really cool. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, six items here, paste here, and then we can do a substitute subset equal to with just subset of replace thing all done I mean look at this all the subset equal to earlier they're all replaced by um, proper subset of okay the other one is needs to be scrolled let me scroll a little bit here all right <clears throat> how many people know what is vi know, know what vi is I am the text editor. Okay, so you could have raised your hand. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, VI is one of those weird things um, that a lot of people in industry use it um, and swear by it, but it is not taught at a lot of universities uh, because the learning curve is steep on this particular editor. You really need time to learn how to use it. What do you mean by using time to learn how to use a plain text editor? I mean, spending time. You really have to spend time, okay? Then you go like, what is the whole point of using VI? 
the whole point of using VI is you don't need a mouse at all to move the cursor around, to search for, for things, to do everything that you ever need to do with a text editor. You don't need a mouse, nor any pointing um, devices. And you guys are thinking, why, why does that matter? Why does that matter? Okay, you guys can, can tell me the answer. Yep. Speed and efficiency, that's exactly right, okay? That extra time that you need to move your right, or you know, mostly right hand, you know, but some people use the left hand, to move it over to the mouse, to move that mouse cursor around, to click on something, that is extra time that you could have spent typing your program. You're talking about what, one or two seconds? Yes, efficiency counts, every second counts, okay? But don't be surprised when you move, transition to a four-year university that you might encounter a class where, okay, that's the only editor we are gonna use in this class. You don't have a choice. Because VI is one of the few things that you can count on regardless of the operating system. You might get into a class where you have to write programs remotely on a server, okay, of some kind, okay? Which means there's no mouse, there's no clicking around, there are no menus whatsoever. Using the keyboard is the only way to interact with the programming environment, okay? And VI is great for that sort of thing, okay? So this is just a little fast forwarding of what you can expect in your next two, three years or so. So, yeah. Can I switch to all the VI Um, yes. There's actually a micro VI or NV, nano VI and NVI. Um, if you go for the smallest Linux distribution, which typically can be found on routers, they don't even bother to install Vim because Vim is too big. <laughs> so they go for either the regular VI, which is already too big, and they have a nano or a smaller VI than the usual VI. And you can find a VI binding on browsers, on Firefox. You can actually get an extension to use your, those key bindings. Yeah. Okay, anyway, digression, digression, digression. So getting back to this question here, is the set that contains AB a proper subset of AB itself? Well, we know it is a subset of, because you know, that's what we said earlier, but is it a proper subset of? Okay, in other words, the question is, about the proper part. So tell me again, what makes a set a proper subset? It's not an empty set. So in this case, is it an empty set? Uh, yes, so it would be false. Very good. In fact, okay, I'm just gonna answer the question in general, okay, this is false, because I can tell you that this it's false. I don't care what A looks like. A can be empty. A can be the entire set of all integers, natural numbers. I don't care. A is a proper subset of itself. It's always false because everything in A can be found in A. There's no extra thing in A that cannot be found in A. Okay? So that's why regardless of what A is, as long as it is a set, it cannot be its own proper subset. Are we good with this one? Okay, Con so you can look at this conceptually. You can look at it from a intuitive perspective. You can also look at it from the definition perspective. They all should come to the same conclusion that a set cannot be its own proper subset. All right, moving on to the next one. What about this one? A a set that contains A is a proper subset of another set that contains A and B. Yep, it's true because the minus AB minus A, okay, AB, the set AB minus the set A is the set B, right? So it is non-empty, so it meets that requirement. Okay, very good. What about the next one? Uh, let me point to this one. The empty set 
is a proper subset, in this case, of a set that contains the empty set itself. Is that true or is that false? It is true, okay, that is correct, because when you do the subtraction, the, the set that contains the empty set minus the empty set is the set that has the empty set as its member. All right, all right. So the last one is not true, okay? Is not necessarily, necessarily true. It really depends on what A is. Well, okay, as long as A is not an empty set, it's good. But if A is an empty set, it is not good. But I cannot universally and just say for any set A. Now, if I say any non-empty set, then the answer is true. So given any non-empty set A, then A, the expression is true. Are we doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to pause a little bit here and see if there are any questions. And for those people who want to catch up a little bit on their writing, you know, this is a good time to do that. Any questions? No questions? All right. So if there are no questions, I am moving on. And we're almost done here. Many times we're interested in the number of elements in a set. This is the notation that I use, okay? You know, I'm not sure what other people use. This is called the cardinality, which is basically just asking how many things are in a set. So in this case, you know, it is essentially the number of elements in the set X. So I'll give you an example here. Uh, the cardinality of the set that has members two, four, six, eight is four. So I, I know how it looks like the absolute number notation, because it is, but in this context, you know, it means the cardinality or the number of things in a particular set. All right, any questions about this entire module? We are done with the first module that has to do with set notations. And then we're gonna digress a little bit to we'll talk about quantifiers. And then we're gonna come back to look at how quantifiers can be used you know, in the definition of these symbols. But first of all, I just want to make sure that there are no further questions about the notations that we have already talked about. Do we have any questions? Nope, okay, all right. So let me point out where we are at this point because you can always read ahead of me. But the most part, I just you know go through the notations you know one by one, using a you know in single direction you know order. So we, this is what we just covered earlier. Okay, this entire thing is done. This is how we take row. So the next item is called basic quantifiers, and then the next one is called big operators, and then we get back to set notations, but this time using quantifiers. So this is how and where. You can find the material that you should be reading for this class. Mm, I suggest you know, some people should read ahead of time, okay? You know, and you know, certainly you know, read after if you want to. If you look at the class, okay, in the lecture, and you go like, I'm not sure about that, okay? That is a good clue and suggestion that you probably should read the material, you know, in the notes or go through the lecture again, okay? All right. So we're moving on, <clears throat> and typically when I transition to move on to a new module, um, one thing some people can do, not, I'm not saying that you have to do it, is to jot down the date and also the time. Because this way, if you ever need to go back to the lecture and say, okay, I need to revisit that particular lecture, you have your own catalog to tell you which date and also at what time in that lecture that I start on a particular module. In other words, if someone later on is to ask me and say, Tech, when did you talk about blah, blah, okay, in this class? My answer is, I don't know. 
not because I'm being mean, and sometimes it is the case, but most of the time it is not, okay? It's because I really cannot remember. It is not my job to remember on which day at what time I start to talk about a particular module. I'm not like Damon, where he can plan out the entire class ahead of time down to the minute. That is not what I do, okay? So if you think that might be helpful, that is what you want to jot down in your own notes, okay? It might be helpful. For some people, it may not be helpful at all, okay? But you get to decide how you want to do that. All right, so we're gonna move on to quantifiers. Sounds pretty fancy, but the thing is, we use quantifiers on a daily basis, okay? Okay, so let, let me think of some examples here, okay? Okay, this is a good one. Tech never answers questions directly. Okay, I think by the end of this semester, most people will have that opinion of me, which is fine. Okay, tech never answers questions directly. Okay, so let's think about how to write that. Okay, so we'll go to Joplin, and this time we'll say, tech never answers directly. All right. And we want to find out what other ways can we use to say exactly the same thing. First of all, I want to get rid of the negation. Never has a hidden negation in it, right? So we want to get rid of that negation. So we'll say, it is not true that, okay? So if I start with, it is not true that, then how do you write the rest of the sentence? So it means exactly the same thing as tag never answers directly. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at this one. Tech always answers directly. And I'll give you an alternative and you guys get to choose which one, okay? Okay, <laughs> now you get to choose. Which one, okay, of these two options here, which one is exactly the same as the original statement, which is tech never answers directly. The first one is it is not true that tech always answers directly. The second one is it is not true that tech answers directly at least once. Which one do you think is the second one, okay? Why? Can someone come up with a scenario where it is, let's go ahead. Yes. So the second one, however, um, if you were to say tack answers directly at least once, then you're answering at least once. However, that's not true now, so you're never answering. Exactly. In other words, if I care, if I cared about my reputation, and I don't want people to say tag never answers directly, all I need to do, if based on the first equivalence, is I only have to answer a question directly once. Then people cannot say that I never answer questions directly. But that's not what it means, right? Because when people say tag never answers directly, that means not even once have I ever observed that tag answers a question directly, right? So that means the first one, the first you know, interpretation captures a lot of the information, but not exactly right, okay? So that means this is not the answer. I'm gonna use uh, the, it does not, oh, okay. So strike out does not even appear as strike out. That is interesting. There we go. So double tilde you know, is a strike out. Okay, I'm using strike out you know, just so that you know, we are clear that this is not exactly the same as that one, okay? And someone may be looking at this and go like, Tech, aren't you splitting hair right here? I would agree because that is my job. My job is to split hair, look at each split hair and split it again. That is 
why we have this class is to describe in very exacting ways. There's no ambiguation, okay? My objective is no ambiguation whatsoever. Why do you think that is important? So what, what happens when things are not exact? You can get errors. You can have two people interpreting the same thing differently. And one of the most infamous examples of that was, I think it was a Mars rover, right? OK, go ahead. You know that story. I'll, I'll let you continue with that one. Yep. Um, it was about the landing. Yeah, yeah. For, like, How quickly? Where the ground is. Yeah. And some of the they had units described, but some of the units that people heard on the news seemed to really just elaborate them at the end of the series. And so some of the people programmed the unit that had been in it as an integer that was like that's the only time you can say that bit for meters, and other people came into the unit, and it wound up burning a whole lot of fuel, adding a lot of Mm hmm Yep. And that was an expensive space, uh, expensive your rover. I hear Mars is hmm? I hear Mars is <laughs> So ambiguation is not good. Now, you guys may be thinking, but I'm not going to make, you know, uh, rovers or landing module for rovers. Maybe I'm just interested in sorting an array. How do you describe, <coughs> if we start with this array, this array as an end result would meet all the requirements of sorting the original array. You guys are thinking that, like, that's a crazily easy question to answer. Everybody knows what sorting is. Well, maybe you do, but the computer does not. So how do you write a testing um, program to look at the output of an algorithm and go like, did the algorithm do its job? of sorting the array, okay? So we'll get back to this example later on, okay? You know, but it does emphasize why it is important to be you know, very precise when we, talk, when, it, when we describe something. That is one of those things, you know, okay, I'm digressing even more, okay? But I think it is really important. When people use um, Copilot on GitHub to have, the, to have Copilot to write code for them, okay? They're, using, they're usually using natural language to describe what the algorithm is supposed to do. Natural language, regardless of which natural language, always has ambiguation, which means Copilot may give you an algorithm, may get most of what you need done, but it may not be exactly what you need. Why is that important in this class, and why is it important to you? Because one, if Copilot is smart enough to do everything that you ever need to do, the companies don't need you anymore. So let's hope that does not happen. Two, if Copilot cannot do everything that a person can do, then you have to ask, so what can I do that Copilot cannot do? One of the few things is when someone describes, okay, I need an algorithm to do blah. You go like, okay, I can understand mostly what blah means, but I got these few, a few different ways of interpreting blah. Which one do you actually mean? So you have to be able to understand where the ambiguation is. What are the possible ways of interpreting blah? Okay, and then you have to ask your client, whoever is requesting the algorithm to be done, and ask, so which one do you mean exactly? Okay, because I can have these possible interpretations of what you just asked me to do. And for those of you who are not convinced, who think that I am just off to the moon when it comes to thinking, which sometimes I do, you can just look up GitHub. Okay, GitHub is a Microsoft product, and they're putting Copilot into everything. 
but this is the this is the one that concerns you the most. So look up GitHub and Copilot. Why am I spelled? There we go. So if you're concerned or if you're curious, go ahead and read articles about your Copilot. Um, it already exists in Excel, Word, you know, most of the Microsoft Office products. It is also in GitHub. In the case of GitHub, it can write code for you. If you describe in natural language what needs to be done, it can give you the code. Okay? Don't, do, don't use it to do your homework assignment. It will help you get past the classes here. It won't help you, you know, get a job when you graduate. Okay, so you know this is a tool. You can use it as a learning tool, but use wisely. Okay, use this wisely. All right, so I'm gonna stop with all the digression here. Okay, <clears throat> and then we are gonna get back to the example that we were just talking about. Okay, tech never answers directly is the same thing as saying it is not true. Okay, wait, hold on a second here. It is not true that. Do we have a notation that means exactly that? Do we have an operator that can do that? It is. Exactly. So we are just going to do this you know, step by step. Okay. All right. So do we agree that this is an awkward way to say exactly the same thing? Because now that we know the, that is the logical negation operator, okay, that makes it a little shorter. Okay. So now we look at this and go like, hmm, what about that at least one? Okay. Can we... Um, you know, handle that one. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think here, you know, how to make this transition. So we'll say, oh, okay, there we go. I know exactly how to do this. We still need a negation. There exists at least one occasion <laughs> that tech answers directly and we had a grammar here grammar problem there we go okay all right so is that okay i mean it is a very long and awkward way to say exactly the same thing but does it mean the same thing okay so now i'm going to replace you know there exists at least one with a mathematical symbol okay because i want to do this kind of gradually Okay, negation, and then we have exists. Okay. There we go. So now we have the negation of there exists at least one location that tech answers directly. So this is a very awkward way to say tech never answers directly. Are we, gonna, are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. Are we associating this symbol to their exists? How do we remember that? Well, all you have to do is to remember how to spell exists. Starts with a E. And the symbol looks like a E, except it is mirrored horizontally, as if we have a mirror that is vertical. Is that okay? All right. So let's talk about the other um, quantifier that we also use a lot, okay, when we are not supposed to be using it. Okay, um, okay there we go. Oh, this is a good one. Tech always digresses. Digresses. Okay. Okay. So the word always, all the time, every, okay, those are 
universal quantifiers. In other words, it happens every single time. Every opportunity tech can dig digress, he would. Okay, so tech always digresses. So in this case, this one is a simple, simple one because you know, there's no need to use a negation because in this case, this is a for all. It's not a very good sentence, but it's, it will do as an example for now. So in all cases, okay, all the time, tech digresses. All right, so let me take a look at the time. We can, we can use a few more examples. Uh, some professors at ARC are great. Okay. All right. How do we express that? Uh, can I just ask quickly, mm -hmm. where you had negation of this, did you also have written that as for all cases? Yes. Okay. But we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to that. You know. But okay, what about this one? Some professors at ARC are great. Okay. So we'll say, um, yeah, go ahead. At least one, yep. So the way we express this is exists P in, I'll just say uppercase A, such that P of A is true. Okay, so I'm, I'll back explain all of these things, okay? Um, a is the set of all professors at ARC, and then P is a predicate such that, oops, cannot spell, such that P of X is true if and only if X is a great professor. There we go. As I said a little bit earlier, all you have to do is to focus on the right-hand side because the left-hand side you know, is just how I type it in LaTeX, in you know, Markdown. So when we say some professors are, at ARC are great, it means the same thing as this, given that A, set A is defined to be the set of all professors at ARC. So that would include me, I would be a member, Iraj would be a member, Ryan would be a member, Damon would be a member, Kakashan would be a member, okay? And then P is a predicate. Predicate is a fancy name for a function that returns a Boolean value. That's all it is, okay? It is just a function that returns either true or false. So in this case, I'm defining P of X to return true if and only if X as the parameter is a great professor. So with the definition of the set A and the predicate P, I can now re-express some professors at ARC are great as this one um, uh, expression here. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so if you're good with this, let me ask you what the next uh, notation means. Okay, so we are keeping the definitions of A and P, but we are going to you know, use another statement, okay? So what does this mean? Okay, so we'll, um, so we'll say for all P in A to mirror what you said, mentioned a little bit earlier, okay? So this is the notation. What does it mean? For all P in A, the negation of P of X. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at the quantifiers. <clears throat> this is a universal quantifier. It says for all. The way you remember this is for all has to do with the first letter of all, which is A, right? This is A, but kind of upside down. So for all P in A. In other words, this is quantifying what this X, oh, okay. I see where the confusion is because I used the wrong variable name, okay. No, excuse me. For all X in A, it is not true that P of X is true or P of X is false, the other way to say it. So what does it mean? Can someone tell me what this is really saying in English? 
Go ahead. Not the not the universe. I already quantify it and use oh, a as a no. as a container. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, exactly. This means you know. Okay, in more colloquial terms, all ARC props suck. <laughs> That's basically what it means. Not a single one is good, okay? Why? Because the quantifier here says every, okay? This is basically saying every professor who teaches at ARC is not a great professor. That's literally what it means. Are we doing okay so far with the notations? Because when we test, when I give you the first exam, I'm not just going to give you something simple like, oh, this is a set, this is another set, what is the intersection? Or, you know, give you some you know, usual typical things. I'm going to test you on do you understand the notations? Okay, I will specifically design questions to test you on notations because that really is what CISP 440 is. It's really just to get you to know the ABCs of how to express logic so that when you move on to a four-year university, they can teach you what to do with those alphabets. We are really just talking about the alphabet here. We're talking about how to spell, punctuations, and stuff like that. We are not even writing essays or paragraphs. We're not even reading, okay? There's no reading comprehension in this, in this class. We're just understanding the symbols. Is that okay? All right, so we are running out of time today which means I got something for you guys to do because you know I need you guys to finish at least reading basic quantifiers. Um, you first and then you. Go ahead. Uh, let me switch back for you. Take a look. You mean here? Yeah, that was totally my bad. Totally. I can see how, you know, P of tech is false. Yeah, we'll put this as X. This is X. There we go. Yep, you're correct. Now, now it is okay. Now it is correct. Uh, go ahead. The first exam, okay, did you read the syllabus? Yes. Okay, what did they say? Oh, I saw, I saw the date for the second and the Okay, it's usually about one third through the yeah, semester. I saw, I saw that one third, right? Yeah, I I don't know yet. It really kind of depends on you know the pace of going through the material, yeah. so it can be off by one or two weeks compared to the yeah, previous I mean, semester. Yeah, yeah, usually about that. You know, it it kind of floats. You know, remember I said I, I'm not Damon. Yeah. So he is the only person who can like plan out everything down to the minute. For me, it is about, you know, okay, when do I get through a particular topic? We can still get a pretty rough idea. Um, if you go th through some of the videos from last, from the last semester, around one third through, you can kind of tell, you know, in which week, you know, we can get through enough material for exam one. Typically, since it's one third and we have 16 week semesters, so I would say, about week six, seven ish, you know, that's when we will get to the first exam. I always give you guys a practice, quote unquote practice, which is me going over one of the versions of the exam from the previous semester. So I would always do that one week before your exam one. So you have at least, you know, that one week. And typically I would tell you ahead of time when we're going to have that practice, you know, session. So you would get, you would get some warning. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions before you guys can go get out of this classroom? No, the, yep, go ahead. VI? Yeah. Um, just Google VI tutorial. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding you, I, I'm not kidding you. I learned VI by myself, so I cannot 
tell you what resources is good. Um, but all the tutorials are great, you know, a lot of tutorials, yep. But don't make it your top priority because remember, it does have a steep learning curve. So just kind of do it as time allows, yep. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. You know, try to review the material and read ahead of time.